it all actually falls into place. I was thinking, is that some sort of diving uh, pun that you guys like to throw out there? <laughs> falls into place. Yeah. <laughs> um, 9.9. Um, hey, everyone. This episode of the 10 Before 10 show is brought to you by Think Tank Social. If you enjoy what we do here, please subscribe and hit that like button. And make sure you ring the bell to be notified of future episodes. Okay, now let's get into the show. So, hey, Laura, thanks so much for joining me on the 10 Before 10 show. Thanks so much for having me, Al. Yeah, no worries. So uh, you took the TTS team through a very different type of session this morning to what they're normally used to. How did you find it? Yeah, I did. We obviously did the high-intensity workout with Patrick beforehand, and then I decided to take the team through a thoracic and lumbar spine mobility program. This um, partly is because I'm actually currently struggling with a sore back, um, but also because I think we're all working from home right now and a lot of us are struggling with tightness in our thoracic just from being hunched over at our workspaces at home that probably are less than ideal. Um, so yeah, I think it was a great time to run the team through those exercises and make sure that everyone's feeling good and we're able to continue working from home. Yeah, they're all loosened up for the day. Yeah. Uh, so, so what happened a few years ago? Do you just wake up one morning thinking, I reckon I should spend the next few years of my life throwing myself repeatedly off a 10 meter high platform? Uh, yep, yeah, that sounds like an awesome idea. Where can I do it? Like, what was the circumstances? It wasn't quite like that. I was actually an Olympic uh, level gymnast. So I was an elite gymnast um, and unfortunately had to have back surgery when I was 16. So that ultimately ended my gymnastics career I spent six weeks in bed recovering after the surgery and actually grew around 10 centimeters in that time. So when I stood up, I was actually quite tall. Um, wow. And tried to, yeah, <laughs> I tried to go back to gymnastics because that Olympic dream was still um, really, really important to me. And I still felt that I'd be able to get back and make it. But my coaches, um, I guess, didn't have the same idea. They actually just saw me as saw me as damaged goods, unfortunately. So um, that wasn't meant to be. And I was very lucky to transfer through the Victorian Institute of Sport. Um, they had a talent transfer program at the time. And yeah, I looked at aero skiing, diving and pole vault. Um, aero skiing was my top sport at the time. There goes um, my next question. <laughs> my next question was going to be, uh, I've noticed a lot of gymnasts go into aerial skiing. What Was there any conversation there? But it sounds like there was. Yeah, there definitely was. Um, but it wasn't meant to be because I think I was looking to transfer just before the winter season in Australia and they just didn't have a level one coach for me at the time and it was too close to the winter season for them to find one. So decided to go to the diving pool and honestly never looked back. I loved my first session. Um, and I guess here we are, six yeah. years on, and I'm still diving, and I, I absolutely love it. So I, I'm wondering, was there a point where you actually might have thought, hey, I reckon I could really make it here in this sport? Was it a pivotal moment or just a gradual process? Oh, I don't know if I, I don't even know if I'm there yet. Yeah, right. Um, I think it's still, part of, it's still part of the journey for me. It's every day I'm just striving to be the best athlete that I can, and hopefully in the end that does make my Olympic dreams a reality. But I don't think there's ever a day where I, I really think, yeah, I've got it. I've, I'm going to make it. Um, yeah. I think you're always just striving for that. And um, with every good competition or good result, of course it gives you a little bit of a boost, but there in sport, there are many lows as well, um, which just knock you straight back down. So yeah, I am still part, of, still on the journey and hopefully can make it a reality next year. I think that, that was the word I was waiting to hear journey. That, that's where you're still on it. So um, I've seen you listed as an Australian 10 meter platform diver. Um, was there something about platform diving as opposed to springboard diving that attracted you to that discipline? Because um, I'm thinking it wasn't a reduced chance of getting hurt. <laughs> Definitely not. No, I think it was just as soon as I walked into the diving pool, I saw the 10 meter, I saw another diver diving off it and I was just amazed. I couldn't believe what she was doing. and. I knew straight away that that was the event that I wanted to do. Um, they also on the tower do a handstand dive. And this is my, still to this day, my favorite dive. It was the first big girl dive that I learned off the tower and I still, I love it. So for me, that was always the goal. And you obviously can't do a handstand off the bouncy one, off the three meter. So tower was always the goal. 
I was just going to ask that. Do, do people try or it's just like, just don't, it's too bouncy? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, people might try it just if you're mucking around, but it's, it's not a competition dive, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember seeing that one on TV. So do you think that platform diving, <laughs> do, you, do you think that platform diving seems to attract a different personality type than springboard diving or you're all just a little bit nuts together? I think every dive is a little bit nuts. And now that I'm actually a platform diver, I have uh, such a, I have so much respect for the springboard divers because for me, the springboard, it's super hard. Um, learning to get the rhythm of the bounce of that springboard takes years. It takes time. And for me, they do so many somersaults, just as many somersaults as we do off the 10 meter. And they've only got three meters plus obviously their bounce. But yeah, so for me, I think everyone's a little bit crazy. Um, but I think that's just being an athlete in general with our routines and our goals and our focus. Um, I think we have a lot of similarities across all the boards. It's a good kind of crazy. It not, is. It is. Not a crazy kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope so. Well, you mentioned I tell myself that. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, you mentioned before the word routine. Uh, now, I know obviously this year was meant to be an Olympic year, um, but what does a non-Olympic year normally look like for a top-level diver? I guess for us, our routine in terms of our training and our structure doesn't really change that much. Um, obviously, the Olympic year, if everything's going well, uh, you typically are traveling a lot because you're on that world stage and it's really important to try and get in front of those world judges as much as you can leading up to that big competition. Um, but yeah, I mean, the our routine doesn't change. We still train the same amount of hours. So I think I train a, around 30 hours a week, give or take, um, depending on my season. And I also do a few extra one percenters to try and get ahead of my competitors because at this level, everyone's talented. So you need to try and find those one percenters. Um, so yeah, our, my structure is the complete same to, depending on the year. Um, but of course the Olympic year is so special because we have so many competitions. The pressure is so high trying to make that Olympic team. And um, we would have had our Olympic trials in June this year. And yeah, even in the build up to that, even like, two months ago, I was already thinking about that competition because it all comes down to those five or 15 dives in the prelim semis and finals. So that's pretty big. And um, I guess now one thing that I'm really grateful for is I have a whole nother year to prepare for that. So I guess that's just how I'm trying to look at it. And, you know, some divers might be and some athletes might be in the position of, oh, no, I was, I was maybe going to retire after this, but I mean, you're still young and you're young in the sport because you came to it quite late. So you appreciate the extra year. I do. I mean, of course, I was disappointed when I heard that the games were uh, postponed a year. I mean, I think yeah. that's only natural. And yes, we as athletes, we all know that it was the right thing to do and mm. it was the only thing to do. But I think there was still some disappointment and sadness there for me because my 2020 season so far was going to plan. I was very happy with the results that I was getting. I was seemed to be going um, like I was hopefully going to be peaking at the right time and everything just seemed to be falling into place until obviously the pandemic and it wasn't. So it all came to a halt. So for me, yes, I think um, I obviously wasn't planning on retiring after this games. Um, but again, I think in a way, yes, it's a good, um, segue because it's given me more time to be that better athlete and hopefully I get better results next year because it's that extra training time. Um, but yeah, of course, a bit of disappointment. Yeah, well, I hope it all actually falls into place. I was thinking, is that some sort of diving uh, pun that you guys like to throw out there? <laughs> it falls into place. Yeah. 9.9. <laughs> um, um, so <laughs> I'm thinking there's been plenty of, even though you've only been doing diving, I think, for maybe around, what, six years? Um, uh, I'm thinking there's going to be a number of highs and lows throughout that career. Can you give us the most memorable one of each? All right, we'll, we'll start with the low. I think um, being an athlete and something that I am probably appreciating more the older I get is that there are a lot of lows in diving or in sport, and um, there are only a few highs. So... And I think that's why the highs are so special because we do have so many um, things that knock us down or we get injured or we have challenges or roadblocks, whatever it might be. Um, but in terms of the hardest thing for me, I think uh, probably just injuries. 
I've struggled with quite a few injuries in my sport, um, sporting career. So whether it was my back surgery in gymnastics or I actually um, really hurt my shoulder and I've struggled with my shoulders since being in diving. And I think that's always really hard because you're, I was out of the pool for 11, 10 or 11 months, which is obviously very hard seeing all my teammates getting to do what I love, getting to do what they love every day. And I'm sidelined. And I think um, that's pretty hard, but also I think what people don't realize is not only is the injury hard to deal with, but the comeback, the comeback is always super, super challenging. And just, I guess you're, you were at the top, most likely at the top of your game when you got injured. And then as soon as you get back in the pool, there's quite a big difference and just, trying to take each day as you go is really important because there are so many days where you can just feel really discouraged because you were like, I could do that so easily before I hurt my shoulder. And now I can't even do the basic um, fundamental thing that once I didn't even think about. Um, and I think that's, that's always really challenging. Um, uh, probably my favorite and my, a couple of my really fond memories. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the world championships last year. And that's what I call my first big girl competition. So that was pretty special for me. And as soon as I got there, I um, just, I remember walking into that stadium and I had goosebumps and it was just, it was massive. I'd never been in anything like it. And just seeing that pool for the first time was really special and getting to compete. I felt really happy. I felt really comfortable. I'd imagined myself on that world stage since I was a little girl. So super, um, almost relieved to be there. Like mm. all those years of gymnastics training and diving training had finally um, almost paid off. It wasn't the Olympic Games, but I felt super special to be on that um, platform in front of all those people. And um, I guess for me, my parents also came. And to me, that was so special. I mean, I, I am very close with my family and seeing them in the audience. And when I made that semi-final that, um, and just seeing them clapping, it was just, even when I think about it now, it's just such a beautiful moment. And I was so glad that I was able to share that with them um, yeah. because they've been a massive part of my journey as well. Of course, you can't so do it without your I parents. Think. Exactly. Um, <laughs> well, no, I want to be able to get to join. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, I've noticed that you recently spent a year as a community custodian for Lifeline. Can you tell us a bit more about how that came about and what it actually involved? Yeah, so this was a program that the AIS um, ran with Lifeline and basically 20 other athletes around the country. So it was 21 athletes in total. We were the Lifeline community custodians. So for the past 12 months, we went to, all of us went to different events, different um, schools, and we all spoke and just tried to raise the awareness for mental health and reduce that stigma. I think it's really important to be those role models in our community because I don't think we talk about it enough. And, that's always been something really important to me and something for me um, as an older athlete, really important to really instill into the younger athletes that, you know, even your sporting heroes or even the, the people in the pool that just always seem to have it together, you know, we all have bad days and it's really important to be courageous enough to reach out and help. And um, yeah, I feel really passionate about that because I think everyone deserves to be happy and um, I think we all need to come together and support each other and, making sure that everyone feels strong enough and brave enough to reach out for help. Cool. Very positive experience, it sounds like. Yeah, it was. And I think for me, I actually got more out of the program than I could have ever dreamed of. I, I didn't really know what I was getting into. It was the first year the program had run and I read the email, the very first email, and I just thought, you know what, this is a great initiative. I'm going to apply for it. I'm not sure yet what I can give to the program, but I was really, I really wanted to be involved because I think, like, as I said, I'm really passionate about it and I think it's really important. So yeah, just getting to talk to people. I, I went to um, a walk in Tasmania and just getting to talk to some of those people was, I wasn't the athlete. I was just part of the community. I, we were all walking. It was freezing cold. Um, and just getting to talk to the community. And it was so nice that even though I wasn't from Tasmania, I really felt a part of that community. We all walked together um, in the early hours of the morning. And um, yeah, that was a really special morning for me. And I'm, I'm forever grateful to be a part of it. Great, great. Um, now, I also noticed you've been doing a bit of work with Channel 7, but not in diving. Please explain. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, diving um, isn't on the TV yet. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Oh, right. Um, but yeah, hopefully <laughs> one day it will be. But yeah, I was 
I actually have a degree in journalism and I would love to have a career in television one day hosting or commentating and I mean keeping the Olympic spirit going being an Olympic host or commentating at the Olympics would be a honestly a dream come true I just love sports so um that's that that's the end goal that's post my diving but yeah I did a little bit of work with them I'm also a fanatic tennis fan so I was very lucky to be working behind the scenes with them at the Australian Open for a few years and honestly I loved it you can't complain getting to see Federer nearly every day and Nadal um have you caught I mean, up with Ash we all love I did. I did yeah. a little bit. Um, of course, I don't. I, I wasn't really talking to any of them. I must yeah. admit, because I was one of the few people that was allowed um, in the tunnels under Rod Laver, and this is kind of the only place those athletes get a bit of privacy. I mean, not very many people, because we all have a pass, and security is pretty strict. Um, but yeah, so again, I'd give them a bit of a smile. I didn't really want to engage in them because that was the only place that they don't have the media there. They don't have, um, they don't have the cameras in their faces there. So um, it was really important for me and being an athlete, I really understood that um, concept of it. So um, I think I might've said good game to Federer once and um, had a bit of a laugh with Nadal in, in the corridor. But apart from that, um, yeah, I just wanted to give them their space and it was just really cool to be walking beside them really i was happy with that <laughs> yeah definitely because i was going to ask you that question next like what were your plans going to be for life after after the pool but uh yeah so media is definitely something that you're focused on definitely i being in isolation i've actually been thinking about this more because obviously this is i guess i'm not diving right now and i guess this is kind of maybe what my life will be like after after sport i mean i'm not obviously going to be in the house but i'm not going to have diving so i'm going to have all these extra hours in the day and i've really been trying to think about it and honestly i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure where it's going to lead me but i'm really passionate about talking and sharing my story i mean my my sporting story has been anything but perfect and anything but a straight line so really passionate about um inspiring that younger generation and that, that next gen of champions as well and just i guess inspiring them to dream because that's something that i really believe in is dream like you need to have a big dream and too often people are told that their dreams are too big or their goals are too big so i just i want to be that little um cheerleader in the background just encouraging everyone to be limitless so um, it's, it's, maybe something to do with that <laughs> it's, that's hilarious it's almost like you can see the questions that i was thinking about asking you because uh, we're getting towards the end of the chat now but i was going to say to you if you were to give some advice uh to some junior athletes you could give them three pieces of, of advice what would that advice be so it sounds like you've already just answered perhaps one of them like think limitless you know no boundaries you know like that sort of thing or well, how about the other two um, so yeah, obviously dream big, be limitless yep. is a really big one. Um, I'm a really big believer in having your A team around you. So create a support team around you. So your friends, your family, um, coaches, whoever it might be, um, have that support team around you because being an athlete there, as I said, there are so many lows. So you need that support team there for you when you get knocked down and, um, I think with every journey, it's just so, it's so nice when you achieve something to have that support team there to celebrate with you. Yeah. And that's something that I've really loved and I've had for pretty much my whole sporting career. And I know that I wouldn't be able to do it without my A team. So, so, so build an A team. And the third one is, and I touched on this a little bit um, in our 10 before 10 chat, mm. but I think just don't be afraid to fail. I think too often there's such a negative stigma around failing, but I, I do believe that we need to fail before we can succeed. Not all the time, but there will often be um, moments in our life when something just really doesn't go well. And then that's when we grow. That's when we have the most growth. I mean, as a, as a junior athlete, I wasn't always on the top of the podium. If anything, I, I possibly was last sometimes. So, and that, yeah, of course that really hurt um, coming last up like a few times, but eventually it taught me, um, taught me different skills that perhaps the winners weren't learning. And um, I think that is what's really important. And that's what has, I guess, brought me through my whole career. So yeah, don't be afraid to fail. That's a great answer. It reminds me of, I spoke with um, Lauren Kitchen. Uh, she's a road cyclist uh, last week. And, um, you know, she was saying that 
when her younger days, she was great, you know, you know, really good at a lot of sports, you know. And, and what drove her to go for cycling was she was rubbish at it. She just kept coming last or, you know, right down the bottom. And she was like, this isn't right. Like, I should be up there, you know. I, and so that's, that's the decision. But I just thought you could add something there to continuing, continuing to fail for something else you said this morning with a 10 before 10 crowd um, about um, your propensity to not quite pull off a number of dives. So there are big, a few big splashes. You've, you've got a bit yeah, of a, <laughs> a reputation, you could say, in the pool. Yeah, so my, my, uh, one of my coaches actually calls me Bruiser. And that is because I had this one time when I was learning this dive that still to this day that I um, isn't my favorite. And I just kept landing short every time, winding myself. And I think I did this five times. And it was five times landing flat. Yeah, like right. usually sometimes yeah. someone will land flat off 10 meter and then they call it a day. They're like, that's all right. I'm good. I'm going home. But whereas for me, it was really important to get back up there. And when I came in the next day, the bruises on my legs were honestly nothing I've ever seen before. And I actually couldn't wear pants for four weeks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So the bruising was, yeah, the bruising was so bad. Is it worse to land on your back flat or your front or is they're both pretty bad? Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. I think maybe for me, yeah. um, definitely my back because one thing, it's not necessarily the pain of landing on your back. I mean, the last time I landed on my back, I actually broke two of my ribs. Um, but basically it's the, you see the roof and you just know you're gone. So and that's a really terrifying feeling for me. Being a gymnast, I'm so used to flipping so that when I get it wrong, sometimes you'll land short because you haven't got enough rotation and that's fine. I can live with that. But getting lost in the air terrifies me and because um, it makes me question my aerial awareness. And you know, as a diver, you never want to be standing at the top of the platform not knowing if you're going to land on your head or not. And I think, yeah. um, so for me, I think landing on my back has to has to take the crown on that one. I, I would just think it would be funny if some joker went up on the roof and wrote whoops on the roof. So you see that. That's the last thing you see before you hit the deck. Yeah, I mean, it goes um, super fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been so good having a chat to you, Laura. Thanks you so much for taking the time as well. Thank you so much for having me on here. Loved yeah. having a chat. and loved the workout this morning. Yep, yep. Sorry I missed that one, but I do have an injury of my own this morning. So, um, but uh, yeah, I was watching it and it was fantastic. So, I mean, um, I've actually got a bit of a strain in my, in my chest as well. I was thinking I could have actually done your workout this morning because it wasn't, you know, like the other ones. It would have been probably just what I needed for my chest. So, I'm definitely. I think especially doing those exercises when I had hurt my ribs as well, doing a lot of those exercises were um, crucial in my recovery. So, yeah. Um, really recommend it. Okay. Well, thanks again for your time and uh, all the best. Thank you so much, Al. Have a great day. Cheers. You too.